It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. So, Kylie, I read recently that 40%, 40% of the world's population uses a meta platform, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, every single day. About three, about 3.25 billion people daily on meta. I actually thought that it would have been a higher number, to be honest. <laughs> really? Well, who doesn't? Well, yeah, I, but we're talking globally. Across the entire planet, 40% of the world's population, 3.25 billion people daily. In today's podcast, Facebook is not your friend, neither is TikTok or Instagram, and it's especially not your kid's friend. If you or your children are collateral damage in their quest to dominate the world and maximize shareholder value by increasing their market capitalization as much as possible, they're fine with that. That's the story today. Today, I want to tell you how we know that and what we can do about it and point you to my website, unpluggedchildhood.org, to help you to protect your kids. Not even going to try and sell you something. Ravi Iyer used to work for Facebook. He was high up, almost at the top, meta research manager. Now he's working at the USC Neely Center for Leadership and Ethical Decision Making. Imagine going from Facebook to a center that's about leadership and ethical Eth- decision making. I, I was thinking I love that. the same, like polar opposites. <laughs> yes. Ravi's been talking with Jonathan Haidt a lot lately, sharing his experiences with Meta and what their research found. And today, we're going to unpack the latest post at After Babel Hates Substack. I love this Substack. I'm not huge on reading blogs anymore, but Jonathan Hates Substack is incredible. Uh, go there, subscribe, get the emails once a week or once a fortnight or whenever a post lands. It will it will just bring you across so much of what's going on when it comes to your children's online safety. This was compelling. Let me quote him just here. He said, in the four years I worked there, speaking of meta, I helped produce dozens of internal reports on the company's news feed algorithms, despite finding evidence that optimizing for engagement often increases exposure to harassment, misinformation, and graphic content. Facebook continued to prioritize engagement over content quality as part of an effort to beat rivals like TikTok. He's not the first person to speak out. No, there's been a number of whistleblowers. In relation to their experiences working with these platforms. And I just find it staggering that you can be a part of something and literally have the data in your face on a day-to-day basis and not do anything about it. Well, he tried to. And, and let me let me continue with Ravi Iyer's words. He says that he's working with Minnesota lawmakers to, and again, I direct quote here, focus on limiting experiences online that present the most harm to children and teens. Unwanted contact, especially from strangers, is chief among them. Social media platforms make it easy for bad actors to contact people they don't know at scale and without accountability. Now, I'm going to stop my quote there. I just, I want to read that again. And just emphasize, it's it's so easy to read the words and not think about the impact of this. Social media platforms make it easy for bad actors, in other words, pedophiles, people who want to take advantage of our children, to contact people they don't know at scale and without accountability. Mm. It's frightening. It's frightening. He goes on to say this, and again, direct quote, one in eight, and this is from internal data at Meta, one in eight Instagram users under 16 experiences unwanted sexual advances on the platform. Earlier this year, the FBI issued a public safety alert after at least 12,500 minors were the victims of sextortion on a range of social media sites, messaging platforms and video games. Motivated by sexual gratification or money, individual bad actors and organized groups, and this is the critical thing here, we've got organized crime syndicates operating on these platforms, <laughs> organized groups targeted young people, coerced them into creating and sharing explicit images, and threatened to make the images public if the miners didn't continue producing explicit content or pay them a fee. Mm. And if that's not gut-churning and sickening enough, let me just, uh, actually, why don't you read the next bit, because I've been reading a lot. In a recent report I helped write, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison spotlighted harrowing testimonies received by his office. One minor reported that they received sexually explicit photos from men who added 
my account. I did not need to add them back to see the image they had sent me. Another teen blocked people bullying him on Snapchat, yet they found ways to add me to group chats and continued the harassment. Okay, so the, the key thing here is it's not just about Meta, and I've been clear about that all the way. I, I mean, I think that Meta, they're at the bottom of the barrel, but there are a couple of other organisations uh, with leadership who are right right alongside them, just, just sliding along the bottom of that icky, steamy, disgusting, filthy barrel. Last thing, last thing that Ravi Iyer said that I want to emphasize, he said this, in one leaked study, nearly a fifth of teens, so that's 20%, nearly a fifth of teens saw sexually explicit content at least once a week on Instagram. AI recommendation systems optimized for clicks, likes, and time engaged rather than the quality of content. And as we found at Facebook, sometimes the most toxic content attracts the strongest responses, fueling the algorithms that show it to more people. Mm. So this is the thing. We've got evidence from whistleblowers, past employees, leaked documents that point to Meta and other executives at other companies as well. But I'm just going to pick on Meta for this one, who are intentionally not doing what they promise us they will do, protect our kids. It's just, it's, it's a lie when they say that they'll do it. It's mendacious. It's completely duplicitous. Facebook is not your friend. The stories are abundant around this idea that they send their kids to schools where there's no devices and they don't use the platforms with their kids and in their families. But all these techno elites are literally responsible for devastation and misery in our young people. They make promises that they're going to do it better. They tell politicians not to legislate and that they'll self-govern and set up systems and it keeps on getting worse. Ugh. But it's not just our kids. It's adults too. Yeah. It's so hard to put your phone down. I know, I know. And the challenge is that everything happens there now. The amount of times we've kind of suggested we're just going to leave our phone behind. Yes. And then we get out and realize that we needed it for someone or we get home and the kids have, have needed us and we haven't had our phones and, and haven't been able to contact us. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's, it's really challenging. I feel like these devices have become – what once was the back fence or mm. the town square, the mm. meeting place. Mm. And it's just so convenient. I'm so, I, I love that you said the back fence. I, I remember as a kid, I'm talking when I was eight or nine, so early 80s, mid 80s. My grandma, my nana Bunt, used to, she'd go and hang out the washing on the hills hoist in the backyard on that quarter acre block in Auburn. And then she'd talk to Joyce over the back fence. Like literally they'd stand there <laughs> leaning against the fence and have a chin wag for half an hour. And they had the time to do that back then mm, as well. I just, yeah. I love it. But ultimately what you're describing is uh, it comes down to this thing called persuasive design, really insanely, intensely smart design. And it points to the fact that there is good that's associated with them. Okay, like you talk about this back fence or this meeting place or this town square or whatever it was that you said. It highlights that we can use these platforms and these devices in really pro-social, optimal, positive ways. But our kids and we are predominantly not using them in those ways. Why? Because of the algorithm. And in fact, now that I say that, I want to share one more thing that Ravi Iyer said. When he was talking about legislation that he's working on in Minnesota, he's he said that while age changes would probably be really helpful, in other words, keep kids off social media until they're older and legislate around that, he says the best legislation will be about algorithms. I fell in love. I, I just love what he said here. He said, laws must, quote, have got to focus on regulating the algorithmic design, not just moderating the content. And here's why. He says, strangers are able to contact minors online because social media companies choose to let them. Regulating what the stranger says is content moderation. Stopping that stranger from contacting a minor is a design choice. It's easier to stop harassment at the source rather than by trying to filter all the messages people exchange. Design approaches can also reduce free speech concerns as they're not based on content itself. That sentence, because social media companies choose to let them. Yeah, that's devastating on every level. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation. That's why I wanted to emphasize Facebook is not your friend, neither are any of the other social media companies. They're interested in shareholder value. They're interested in market capitalization. They're interested in stock returns. That is it. After the break, what European Parliament is trying to do about this. So 
So this podcast episode is called Hurting Kids on Purpose. The evidence suggests that that's exactly what's going on. And Kylie, uh, European policymakers, I found this, this is such a great document. I, Euro, European policymakers are really concerned about how children interact with the digital world. And they've released a report emphasizing the importance of online safety, obviously, and digital literacy. We know this already for young people. But in the report, they stress the need to protect children from online exploitation and manipulation like targeted advertising and data misuse. And they've made a, it's, they've called it a motion for a European Parliament resolution on addictive design of online services. So what they're basically saying is, yes, this is about consumer protection, and yes, this is about um, targeted advertising and data misuse. But fundamentally, what they want to do is they want to shut down the harmful elements of persuasive design. Are you familiar with persuasive design? Do you know the term? No. At all. I think I'm like most parents. I've never really heard those words put together. I can I can make an assumption as to what you're talking about, but I've never heard. Okay, so term. persuasive design is literally what Ravi I is talking about, where he says the the social media companies have designed their technology in such a way that certain things happen. Mm. So the persuasive element is how do we keep people's attention longer? Yeah, everything that they've done is designed that way. I'm going to mention a handful of persuasive design items, and I'm going to see if you can explain them to me if you can. So here are some persuasive design features for maximizing user attention. Number one, autoplay. Yeah, so you just it just keeps playing. Yeah. Like as you scroll, it's playing. Okay. And and that is set up so that as you scroll and it's already playing, it hooks you immediately. You don't have to make an intentional choice to press play. That keeps you focused on the screen. Mm-hmm. That's what TikTok and that's what Instagram, that, that's what they that they all do. Even even things like YouTube and uh, and Netflix. Or uh, infinite scroll. Well, you just keep scrolling. There's no stop. I do remember once upon a time you kind of got to the end of your feed. Yes, yes. Yeah, about 15 years ago yeah. you could you could say, hmm, I'm up to date. I yeah. actually know what everybody's doing in their lives yeah, yeah, yeah. and now I can switch it off because there's nothing new that's happening. No, and what's interesting is if I've looked at something earlier and I want to find it, I just can't find it again. Like the scroll process just takes way too long. Okay, you'll know what these ones are, push notifications and badges. Yeah, you've just got these little notifications that come up and you push your little button and say yes or no or whatever. Did you know in the early days Facebook made them blue? Nobody clicked on them. They made them red. Everyone thinks, oh, this must be important. Mm. We associate the color red with importance and and, and it it promotes that sense of urgency and the fear of missing out, which means that people are going to check the app because they've been triggered to look at it because they're concerned that they're going to miss out on something. And often they're flashing too. They're kind of grabbing your attention and you just want them to stop. Here's another one. Uh, And again, this one kind of speaks for itself, personalized recommendations and content feeds. Yes. I I love that little thing at the end that says, do you want to see more of this? (laughs) Yeah, like tell us tell us how we can addict you even more. Tell us how we can keep you here longer. The algorithms literally curate content that's tailored to your preferences, which makes the content feel so deeply and profoundly relevant and it keeps you engaged. Um, Streaks. Can we just talk about streaks for a second? This is one of your favorites now, isn't it? Well, it's hilarious. Obviously, I signed up to Snapchat a a handful of months ago. And on the Happy Families podcast, you did comment that you think that Snapchat is perhaps your favorite app of all time. I don't think I said that. I'm pretty sure you were. I don't think I said that, but I did. But you said you loved Snapchat. I did have lots of fun with the kids. They downloaded it for me. (laughs) They showed me all the filters. And can I tell you, I have just had an absolute ball Mm. and the girls and I have gone back and forth with these crazy messages that just make me laugh. Welcome to the 21st century. (laughs) (laughs) So in the beginning, I actually did really enjoy it. I I loved Mm -hmm. playing with the filters and it's heaps of fun to kind of just have that to and fro and the voice changing and all of that kind of stuff. But there were plenty of things that really frustrated me about the platform and specifically those disappearing messages. I can see how, in the wrong hands, these could be devastating. Uh, this is the persuasive design element, though. It, it keeps you connected. It keeps you engaging with the app in in these ongoing ways. You've got rewards in games. You've got social validation with likes and comments and shares and follow accounts. Uh, these engagement features are persuasively designed. Um, variable rewards, I mean... It really is about dopamine. It is about the next hit. Uh, there's a couple of other things as well. The um, the time sensitive content. If you don't look at it now, if you don't take advantage of it mm-hmm. now, you've got disappearing messages and the scarcity and the urgency. 
and just the the sound effects and the visuals. There, there are so many other things. Oh, the frictionless design, the way that you just, you're in and you're using it. They've made it so, so easy. And, and the whole purpose of this podcast really is for me to say one clear thing. They're doing it on purpose. They're doing it on purpose and they, they're not thinking about you. If you've got young kids... We, we re- and when I say young kids, I mean kids under about 12 to 14, we really do recommend you keep them away completely. Delay their access as long as you can. Uh, visit unpluggedchildhood.org for more and sign the pledge. You could have a listen to our uh, podcast interview last Wednesday with Danny Alachi from the Heads Up Alliance. Learn more about keeping phones out of our kids' hands. Um, just sign the pledge. Uh, let's keep let's keep our kids uh, away from having a screen based childhood and let them have a play based childhood instead. And as they get older, it's really about making sure that they've got things happening in their lives that are incompatible with their phone use. Right. If they're out busy doing things and you know using their bodies, being mm-hmm. active, they can't hold a phone. <laughs> They'll try. <laughs> play, they will try. Play the drums, play the guitar, <laughs> play the piano, go for a bike ride, anything. Uh, we're going to link to resources in the show notes if you'd like more information. We really hope that it's useful in helping you in your awareness of the issues and your conversations with kids. Bit of a heavy one today, um, but I think it's one that we've just we, we've got to keep on raising awareness about it and talking about it. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rowan from Bridge Media. And if you'd like to know more about how your family can be happier, especially with stories like that one. Uh, Sign up to our free super helpful newsletter at happyfamilies.com.au. 